Well, hello out there, Oklahoma City. How are you? Oh, come on. It's, it's, it's still the middle of the day. Y'all got to have a little more energy than that. Try again. How are y'all? You having fun at Super Bitcoin? There we go. Thank you very much. All right, a couple minutes uh, late, area a little late, and uh, trying to give a few more people a chance to get in here, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Patrick Scott Patterson. I'm here Thor we Ackerland. got Thor Ackerland, the gentleman who, as I try to destroy the set, let me try that again, the gentleman who won this puppy right here, the 1990 Nintendo World Championships. Give him a little, give him a little love for that one. Come on now. I actually, I, I'm actually borrowing this at the moment. Don't tell anyone. No, that's not, there's actually a booth out there. This was found. This is actually uh, an original advertisement for it uh, when it stopped here in Oklahoma City. The building right across uh, the, the way here, the Cox Pavilion, was where uh, that was taking place back then. So it's kind of fitting that we're here today. Um, we actually both got to participate in it back then. He obviously did a lot better than I did. Um, I completely choked in the semifinals in Dallas. Um, but I, I'm, I'm thrilled that to have the opportunity to come up here and speak about this, both of us, and kind of reminisce on this because the 1990 Nintendo World Championships is, is this, I don't think it gets enough attention in a day, world today where, you know, eSports is a word and, you know, these, these League of Legends championships and these you know, Call of Duty championships, actually there's one of those going on this weekend as well, all that sort of stuff gets so much attention and so much hype and yet it still, there was, that was the beginning. That was the, that first big, big, big event. And, and it came at a time where I, I just don't think you can even replicate it because as big as something like League of Legends or Call of Duty or something is today, Nintendo at that time had, what, 90-something percent of the marketplace. It was video gaming. And then uh, Dallas was the first stop, the Fair Park and the Automotive Building. I can still picture it when I walk in there during the State Fair of Texas now with the big stage and the, the gameplay counselors and Howard Phillips and his little bow tie and, and all that sort of thing. And it was just the most amazing thing to a 15-year-old kid who lived and breathed Nintendo. And Thor, you, you got the pleasure, my parents wouldn't let me do this, to go to a whole bunch of these events as your adventures. But what was that first wow moment of walking in there and, and seeing this gigantic setup that they had for that? Uh, well, the, the whole experience was sort of overwhelming to start with, um, just like parking and walking to the thing. It was like going to a concert, and they had this inflatable Mario that I remember that was like 40 feet tall or something. You walk by that dude, and he's kind of sitting there bobbling around. Then you go inside, and it's just all games, 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 games. And um, it was huge. I mean, it took a really long time to get through the whole thing. There was always something interesting to see. And it wasn't just a one-day thing. It was the whole weekend. And... Something I think isn't publicized a whole lot is the fact that the thing went on for nine months. Uh, it went to the 30 uh, biggest uh, event halls it could find across the nation uh, through the year. So most of 1990 was this single contest. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, you know, you had Super Mario Brothers. I, I thought personally it was a weird combination at the time because you had Super Mario Brothers, which was even iconic then. And you had Tetris as the third game, which was the hot let's push this and then, you know, obviously they were right to do that because I mean who here hasn't played Tetris right we even though we're all clapping to it beforehand but then Rad Racer in the middle which just <laughs> seemed to me to be kind of an odd like I honestly hadn't even played Rad Racer at that point I knew Tetris I knew Super Mario Brothers really well everyone did but it's like Rad Racer I mean what did you think about the the three games that were in the contest the three games that they chose for what turned out to be the biggest contest they ever did if I had to guess, I, I would think that maybe they were doing it just so they have three very distinctly different kinds of games. Um, I think, wasn't Rad Racer Squaresoft? Yeah. Yeah, so that's pretty cool that it was a square game. Uh, <laughs> but everybody was just racing to get through it, you know. I, I would have been cool if they'd randomized the tracks or something, because you always have that one track in the desert, and everybody's like, okay, <laughs> let's get to Tetris. Now, you know... Um a bunch of other things, you know, me and him were talking about this earlier. We, we couldn't wait for this panel to reminisce on this thing. Um, and one of the things we talked about outside on this was that this was the first event of its kind, not just competitively, but it was the first event that I've ever seen where they had games out there that hadn't come out yet 
that were coming up. And I mean, nowadays, you know, there's already, you know, E3 and, and the Comic Cons and all that, that that show these games that are coming out, sometimes a year, year and a half before they do. And of course, you see trailers and sometimes you even get to get into beta testing. Back then, to get your hands on a game that wasn't going to be out until that Christmas or, or whatever, was that was something we'd never got to do before. Um, what do you think of, of that instance? I mean, it, how different do you think, or how much of an impact do you think the, them doing that there might have had on what came to follow? I think it influenced them uh, probably quite a lot in terms of dealing with uh, more publicly oriented uh, gaming events and reveals. Because they got to see a lot of positive feedback from uh, the kids that got to go there and play the games because they just got really excited. I mean, I would travel around to this thing, you know, with a, there was not a whole lot of people that did that. But you'd see the kids come in, you know, and the doors open and they, you know, eyes get big and they see these really cool games they didn't get to play previously. Now, um, the contest, you know, it changed a little bit. I, I like I said, Dallas was... Um, the first stop, which is where I was based out of. So, I mean, it was really awesome to get to see it. And I remember the first day, um, a lot of people, they weren't going through to Rad Racer and Tetris. They were actually just trying to stay on Super Mario and go and do the, the turtle hop trick uh, to try to rack up a bunch of points and qualify. And um, they actually changed the rule in the middle of the contest. That's like got on the mic and it was like, okay, look, you can't do that anymore. And, um, but now a bunch of people had already qualified and, and what have you. And, um, but I noticed something, because after, after I got eliminated in Dallas, I, was, I would track it, I would watch it through news clippings and magazine reports, and I started noticing the scores got bigger and bigger and bigger anyway. And I saw his name start coming up a lot. I knew who he was from that. And a lot of people were picking him to win it from the early get-go. How do you think it changed, and why did it change? Explain to them why the scores started going up, and what some people started to notice about how these, how this competition cartridge was acting um, as the the tour went on, especially with you and those the others that were going around on the tour with it. All right. Well, I'm going to take you guys back to a time before social media. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you had Nintendo Power, but that wasn't fast enough as far as uh, sharing information. There wasn't really a lot of tips in there. So it was really like, you know, gamer to gamer at the conventions, and you'd have a small group of people that go around, and you'd spot things that people would do. So the gist of it is this. Like, you've got 6 minutes and 21 seconds. You start out in Super Mario Brothers, get 50 coins, go to Rad Racer, complete one lap of this boring desert track, and then Tetris for the rest of the time until the time expired. But the scoring was set up to where you would get, you know, if you got 3 million points or something, 2.9 million points of that would be in Tetris. So you wanted to get into Tetris as quickly as possible. So every second you could shave off of Mario and Rad Racer would give you a better chance of getting a high score. So all the different players would just experiment with things. And the, the end result was really bizarre because you'd watch somebody, uh, if you didn't know what was going on, you might think that they had gone crazy because the Mario strategy that ended up working for people would be, you know, get a certain amount of coins, die on purpose, and you start out near a coin block, get those coins, die again until you got your 50 coins. And even Rad Racer had an aspect of this, like towards the end of the track, if you uh, drove off the course and crashed your car, you would slide to a stop faster than if you just drove over the finish line. So it was almost controlled chaos. And all these little tiny things might have you know, saved a second here, three seconds here. But as a result, the scores started out in Dallas, you know, sub-million points mostly. You know, 500,000 was a decent score. 800,000 was really good. Towards the end of the tour, it was, you know, two, three, and four million points just from these changes. And this was all word of mouth, experimentation. I mean, probably if this was the Facebook era back in 1990, uh, you know, it might have been like day two of the first <laughs> first deal. It was just a different world. Yeah, I mean, it was just recent years that I had learned this, and I was disappointed to learn that, you know, yeah, I was in the Dallas one, and I mean, I think that was pretty straightforward. I like, get 50 coins as quick as we can, get through Red Racer as quick as we can, get the Tetris. But, you know, it turns out that if you ended Super Mario on the right type of score, then you'd get a, a little different of a Red Racer course, and you'd even could get Tetris, the, the, a certain version of Tetris that actually wasn't 
necessarily random. It was kind of based on what had happened, what you, how you had finished up in the previous two games, and people were using that as well to their advantage because they were able to anticipate better. And, and so, yeah, it's just like, well, geez, you know, I mean, it's the people who, who got to travel around a bit or at least the people who came later, you know, we didn't we didn't stand early, stand a chance in Dallas. Uh, <laughs> even if I, I hadn't choked out, we, we we didn't know that. We didn't pick up on that back then. Yeah, I feel like maybe some people uh, didn't tell me that on purpose. It's really funny if you, you watch uh, the uh, <laughs> the finals, because I didn't know this, that the patterns would replicate. It was based on the timing in Mario Brothers. So I guess I was just... Like, like the ends, the, like the last three digits of the score or something like yeah, that. Yeah, something weird. But I get the same Tetris blocks on the finals three times in a row. I play it three completely different ways because uh, I had no idea that there was a pattern. So I was just playing on instinct. I never really had a um, thought process planned out in ad advance on Tetris. But uh, I, w I wonder what... I never really had the urge to go back and replay it, but I kind of wonder what I could have done if I'd known that. Now, you know, um, one of the things that we also talked about outside, and kind of we'll touch on this a little bit, we had, you know, it was the first time we really got to see some of these people we saw on Nintendo, Ma uh, Nintendo Power Magazine in person. We got to see Howard Phillips and his little bow tie and, and him doing his thing, and those, you know, fabled gameplay counselors who... Uh, didn't seem to know as much uh, when asked point blank, I guess, without the big book to look through. It's actually kind of funny to, to stump them a little bit. But, I mean, the, the person that actually stood out to both of us the most was this MC. His name was Terry Lee Torok. Uh, he had this, this, you know, typical early 90s pompadour mullet kind of combination thing, you know. And um, he's this, he was leaping around the stage like an like a over-caffeinated Willy Wonka. You know, just this excited the whole time. He's somehow the most energetic person in a place full of uh, teenagers and kids. Um, I mean, you spent a lot more time with Terry and clearly than I did. What what stands out to you the most about him and, and just his style and how he did everything there? The thing that I think um, stands out to me most about him, of course, is his energy. But he was also an extremely kind person, and extremely intelligent, and... Um, he really put a lot into it because that energy that you saw, he'll be running across the stage wearing all this, like, <laughs> get up, right? So he's starting at the, when this thing opens, you know, and for two or three days straight, every weekend he's running around like a maniac. Tetris! <laughs> you know, he's, he's narrating the whole thing. And then after that, you know, there would be like a Bennigan's or whatever in town. And, uh, you know, he'd be sitting there and he'd just sit there and talk to you. Just really uh, easygoing, nice guy. Now, you know, I, I talked uh, and start, started this thing out mentioning how that contest, I mean, it was the first real, you know, thing like it. I mean, there'd been competitive contests going back in time, going all the way back to the early 80s, but nothing that had ever been of that kind of scale that went to that many cities and had this big stage. I mean, a lot of people I've heard over time kind of compare it to the wizard. And maybe it wasn't, it wasn't quite that corny. But, um, you know, it was, but I mean, but it kind of was. You had the big screen, you had the, the, you know, just the pomp and circumstance to it. And it, it, they never did one like it again. They did other, you know, they started calling it the Power Fest after a while. Even actually shortly after the original one started, they kind of started slipping that name in there a little bit. But they did smaller ones after that, mostly setting up and you know, college campuses and the little, like, truck and the, you know, they, they, I played one at Six Flags Over Texas. I even played one in a parking lot of a venture department store in 94, one of the later ones. But never anything of that scale did they ever do again. Um, again, you, I mean, you were on the road, you traveled around with this, and you went to the finals and you did the whole thing. You were front row and center in this whole thing. Why do you think that they never did another one on that scale again? And did it surprise you that it, that was a one and only one and done type of level that they did? Yeah, first off, I was extremely surprised that they didn't do it again because these events were not sparsely populated. They were packed to the gills. I think the final count, there was 2.2 million um, entrants, individual uh, game entries. Um, so this thing was packed, and then they had the big finals at the um, Universal Studios Hollywood. 
But they, I, I did hear a little bit that there was a uh, TV negotiations that was supposed to be broadcast for the finals. Something went wrong there. Uh, this was also a time when um, Nintendo of America, Nintendo of Japan, Nintendo of America was sort of a custodian of the American market, but I don't think they got to make a lot of truly independent decisions in terms of business. I think they, they got the product, they uh, translated it, they marketed it, but something on the scale of the Nintendo World Championships, maybe the uh, powers that be over in Japan said, well, I don't know why we're doing this, and they couldn't see the uh, benefit. Because the only um, the NOJ representatives I saw were at the finals, and they were dead serious, um, polite, but they, were not, uh, they weren't as enthusiastic as the, uh, the American corporate executives were, that's for sure. Now, you know, you, like I said, you ended up, you, you, know, you won eventually your age bracket, and then the, like, the unofficial like, three-way playoff afterwards, and you won that one as well. And, uh, you know, you got the big trophy and the, and the pomp and circumstance and all the, the recognition and the pictures and the articles. Um, of course, nowadays we have, this is a little more commonplace, you have a lot of people that want to be the pro professional gamers or, or perceive themselves as already being such, and they want this recognition and they want that. Some cases you get that, and some of these people that win some of these major uh, championships, uh, you know, the teams and the clans especially. Um, what can you say, being the first person to ever win anything of this scale, uh, how, how you thought and felt at the time, and maybe a little bit about what came to be as a result of you winning, a little bit of the aftermath of your big win? Well, uh, I don't want to bore anybody with my life story uh, but if you look on uh, YouTube, I'm sure you can find some videos of me afterwards. The first thing I said to Terry Leotorak, I think he asked me, uh, how does it feel? And I said, uh, I'm glad it's over. Because <laughs> uh, I, was, I was a kid, I was tired. I had, my house had burned down the year before. We really desperately needed this uh, prize money to, to sort of move forward. Uh, I won a car that I never got to drive. I, I wanted to give it to my brother, but we had to sell that. Um, and then we ended up getting into negotiations to endorse games. And of course, being 13, I wasn't you know, really in charge of anything. Uh, I did like Micro Machines. <laughs> the other games that they had me uh, quoting were somewhat hilarious. We were talking about that earlier. Um, I think uh, one of them says, absolutely brilliant, uh, in quotes. And, uh, and put his name with Thor Ackerlin, Nintendo World Champion. <laughs> yeah, because they would ask me to, to say something about these games, and I'd be like, I don't know what to say about this one. And uh, the programmers were British, and absolutely brilliant is a uh, quintessentially <laughs> British thing to say, I think, circa early 90s. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, this, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, a, a Nintendo Texas kid, you know, being, I, being one myself, we wouldn't have said absolutely brilliant. I mean, yeah. you know, the spot to tea, Governor, you know, whatever. It's like the, uh, <laughs> have you seen the rage face with the guy with the monocle? <laughs> <laughs> that, that fits perfectly. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Indubitably. Yeah, I don't know, whatever whatever they say over there. I think no just, one's British uh, in here, right? Okay, good. All right. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, um, you know, one more, you know, we get on this, and we'll kind of go into some Q&A here. Um, you know, we talk with these people here, but uh, here we are. I mean, we're right across from the Oklahoma City stop. It's, it's 28, you almost, you know, yeah, all, all these decades later, right? Did you think at that time that you were doing something that you'd be talking about right now, all this time later, did you ever think it would resonate this far uh, into time and going forward? Uh, no, I didn't think that I would be relevant uh, in any way or that, that we would remember it that much. The reason I thought that was, uh, you know, you see like the Super Bowl year after year, you see things like that. I thought that it was going to get much bigger, um, that it would become like an annual thing. I'm still puzzled as to why they didn't make that decision because it would have been an easy one. Great way to... Uh, get positive press, you know, interact with the gamers, get feedback from the gamers, and show new games. But they just uh, they didn't do it. So, uh, yeah, I'm extremely surprised, and uh, I guess I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, Actually, we'll toss one more out. Did you ever think you'd see the kind of prices that you see on, on these competition cartridges? You know, I mean, we all, I know they were rare. Uh, I mean, they're literally the holy grails, and... and 
I mean, there's, there's so much talk about them. You've even seen them on Pawn Stars now, you know, and, you know, uh, did you ever think that you would see those things going for that kind of money? Oh, uh, no way. You know, it's funny, though. My dad and this other, there was like another champion, Kenny Welch, and my dad and his dad saw the Nintendo Power thing where they're going to give away 26 gold carts. And so they both went to Howard Phillips and was like, hey, you're giving away these, you know, gold carts to a random uh, drawing, but why don't you give the other carts to the city champions? And Howard Phillips was like, okay. <laughs> so that's the reason we have those. They were supposed to all be destroyed. Uh, it was just a couple of gamer dads that said, hey, give them away. What happened to yours? Uh, mine is, uh, have you seen the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark? <laughs> <laughs> uh, pretty much. Um, also, Hoarders. Um, combine those two in your mind, and that's my dad's uh, garage. And it's been sealed since then. Yeah, I see. I was hoping he would say that because I've been bugging him for years. I, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't have a hard time finding too many people that would want to go dig that up out of that house. Am I correct? <laughs> you know, going a little like, you know, going a little dig and, and try to find that stuff. It would be like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, I just need to get my hat and my whip and uh, maybe some <laughs> some raid and uh, other stuff like raid. that. Okay. Flamethrower. Oh. Now, I mean, um, like I said, this this 1990s in the World Championships. I mean, we got the champ here, got Thor Ackerland. This is this is the opportunity I think some people have probably wanted for a long time because this has become such this fabled thing. Like I said, with the values of the cartridges and the talking about it and the way people, I was talking out on the floor today, they were like, yeah, you ever see the wizard? It was like that. It was this big. And of course, it's become almost like Paul Bunyan size now. Even as big as it was, it's become this even bigger thing. Here's a chance to ask the champ anything about that contest, anything you want to know. I need to see a hand go up. Q&A time, or we're just going to, there we go. You, sir. Well, um, yeah, people had a lot of different things, mostly in how they, like, uh, behaved or, or encapsulated their experience. You saw a lot of people that would wear headphones, um, and then people uh, had timers, you know, which I sort of understood, you know, but then again, I never really played with one, but my dad had a little watch and he would try to like beep at me or whatever, alarms. <laughs> um, but yeah, for the most part, uh, once people figured out that uh, you needed to get to Tetris as fast as possible, that's what everything was focused on. Um, I wish that I had thought about it a little more because beyond that, Every time you drop a piece in Tetris, if you're playing the Nintendo Championship Repro cartridge or if you got it, one of the grays, um, dropping the piece from the top to the bottom takes a while. So if you let it stack up a little bit and then try to keep your stack sort of mid-range, every time you drop a piece, it takes less time so you can get more blocks. And then if you know how much time you got left, then you can start busting it down in the last minute. If I'd known that then, I might have got five million. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm, that's, that's, again, that's, that kind of goes, too, into how this thing progressed. Because in that first stop in Dallas, I mean, none of, none of us were even thinking about that sort of thing. You know, I mean, we were just playing up until the time was over, and then it would be, you know, a little screen would come up, da -da 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 -da, and then, <laughs> yeah. you know, we're out of time, and we're just hoping that we'd made the cut. Um, certainly would have, I should have thought of the headphones thing. You know, maybe I wouldn't have noticed that, you know, TV camera that, came over my shoulder and caused me to screw up uh, my chances to be the, you know, maybe compete with him a little more head on there. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to me in, in a day and age now where, like he mentioned before, there was social media and internet and stuff now where, you know, I mean, let's face it, there's almost, you, you can find a playthrough of most new releases now within, you know, almost instantly, sometimes even before they come out, you know. Back then, that wasn't around to, to learn that people went through that much trouble and studied it that much along the way, along the road. Um, it's kind of, I don't know, precursor to that. I think it's kind of cool. Anyone? Oh, you, sir. Oh, awesome. We got another, another competitor in the house here. 
Oh, no, no. Um, I practiced in multiple cities. Uh, they only let you win one, and that was, uh, that was a smart thing to do because if they let people win multiple cities, it would have been really unfair to the other people. Uh, you won uh, your family uh, vacation to uh, the finals in Hollywood. Um, there was something else like a $500 gift certificate, some random games. I remember, I think I won like a U Force, which was this really terrible <laughs> controller thing. Yeah, fold it over. It was by Broderbund, yeah, and you yeah. had that. If you had tiny hands, it would have been awesome. But. Yeah, I very carefully opened it and determined that it was terrible, and then I put it back in the box. And I, <laughs> I took it to, uh, I think it was Children's Palace, and I was like, can I exchange this? And the guy's like, okay. And I got, uh, I don't know what I got. I think I got Final Fantasy or something. It was much better than a U-Force. <laughs> oh, man, I had like a box of those things. Because um, they, they give you one every time you qualified. The, you got more than 100,000 or whatever ridiculous score. What's um, interesting about that, though, is those, you know, I'm glad, too, that you agree those painter's caps was terrible. In Dallas, it was actually, you got a T-shirt, which I, which I wish I had remembered the bring, but it's, it was a, you know, it was a white, cotton white T-shirt, and it had the logo on the, on the chest, and it had just in the biggest font they could fit on the shirt on the back, official semi-finalist. And so you... You got to strut around there like you were pretty cool wearing one of those, right? Because, I mean, you'd, you'd made the cut, and, uh, you know, in Dallas, no one knew anything about this, so it was kind of cool to have made the cut. And then, yeah, I started seeing pictures in the magazines and stuff, and, yeah, they replaced it with these just dorky-looking painter's caps that just said NWC. They looked like they could made them five minutes at the, you know, the shop around the corner, you know, and brought them to the event in a big box. Like, we just want the cheapest thing you can give us. And um, so I, I don't know why they went away from the shirts, but you know, I'm glad I kept mine because that's, you know, a lot of people don't even know that those, they handed those out and they were a lot cooler than those caps. Oh, there was, uh, later on in the tour, there were these awesome black trucker hats, which were, uh, they were almost like pre-hipster hipster. Like if somebody had a PBR and one of those hats now, they would be really <laughs> awesome. It was cool though. They were way better than the white hats, but it was strange because they were so freaking big that if you saw one like on a you know 12 year old like we were all little kids then it just like swallowed your head you know nwc maybe that was the point yeah. yes sir are you talking about the very final game yeah. um actually uh i don't remember it super clearly unless I'm watching it but I did know that I was going to win before like maybe in the last 20 seconds or so and it was because of the announcer uh, because Terry Lee Torok the way he was narrating it I was hearing the uh, the scores and him counting down and I calculated that he needed uh, second place guy he needed like two Tetrises in the remaining time it was just technically impossible and I was like Oh, well, I won, finally. And I was just relieved. I was like, it's over. <laughs> I can go home. Um, but um, let me see. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I guess I should have been more excited, but I was just relieved. <laughs> oh, he's got another one. He's, he, he beat me to it, man. <laughs> I, that's funny. Um, he there's still, a he still play Tetris now. Sometimes he can still rock Tetris. Yeah, I, 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 once in a while. <laughs> once in a while. After about 20 years, the third place guy uh, dug me up. Um, Robin Mahara, we're really good friends now, and he made a movie uh, called Ecstasy of Order about trying to find the best Tetris players. And I hadn't played it. I didn't have a Nintendo, and uh, so he sent me a Nintendo and a Tetris cartridge. And um, the movie follows us trying to. Uh, you know, find the best Tetris player. It's really cool. Look it up on iTunes, Hulu. Uh, it's Ecstasy it's, it's, of Order. It's a good film. Uh, it's one that it's, I mean, I know there's a million video game documentaries now, and I think two million coming. But it's one of those that is actually really solid. It tells an awful lot about him, his backstory and has a, a good ending. It's one that I, I kind of wish hadn't fallen. I mean, fell through the cracks a little bit compared to what some other ones have. Definitely look it up. It's worth watching it. Anybody? Yeah. 
Thank you, sir. We're just going right down the row here. I love it. I think it's possible. Um, one of the good things is that the, um, the people involved in making the repros, they do a round of them every now and again. They're, they're pretty easy to get. Um, it's also really easy to tell the fakes thanks to um, the way the boards were constructed. They used um, these extendable, erasable, uh, programmable ROM chips, the EEPROMs. So if you take the uh, shell off of one, you can immediately tell um, whether it's legit or not. And, and what's awesome about that, too, is you do have, I mean, that, that event left such an impression on the people who played in it is that you have a very, I mean, you all, I don't think you can list one of those cartridges for sale anywhere on the Internet without the community pouncing all over it and discussing it and deciphering it, sometimes even tracking down the whole lineage of that cartridge based on the number on it. So, I mean, it's, it's going to, it's luckily because of that very proactive community that's very passionate about that, and if somebody tries to pass a fake off on something, which we've had, we've had people try to do that on eBay using someone else's picture mm -hmm. or whatever, it, usually it gets caught and called out and found out ahead of time that, you know, before somebody gets ripped off. That doesn't mean something doesn't happen on a private market, but it's 2014. Who's, you know, there's not really a lot of those out there anyway. So, you yeah. know, luckily uh, you have a very proactive community that, that you know, is very knowledgeable and, and very vocal if somebody's trying to take advantage of somebody there. Yeah, by far the most common scam is uh, somebody stealing a picture and trying to say that they're going to sell this cartridge, but it actually they don't even own it. They're just trying to get you to send them money internationally. <laughs> yeah, likely they get caught, at least as far as I know they've gotten caught so far. There's some numbers that come up again and again that are uh, pretty funny. <laughs> Oh, well, actually, I'll toss that since no hands are going up real quick. There was one recently that went up that it had the label ripped off. And um, I, I laughed on my end, not because of the auction, but because it was uh, that auction was obviously trolled. I mean, the, the price went insane. I mean, insane even for one of those cartridges. And yet there were people like reporting on it going, oh, it went for this. I'm like, no, there's no way that's trolled to death. What do you think about that? What do you think? First of all, what do, really, what do you think happened to that cartridge? How did someone have one of those cartridges that had the label ripped off and handwritten? Someone wrote Mario on it. What do you think happened? How do you think that happened? Or do you know how, what happened there? Well, um, I know that a lot of cases, there's a limited amount of uh, people out there that are willing to spend, you know, high four-digit and into the five-digit range for cartridges. So when you get a game like that on eBay, a lot of times what happens afterwards is a private deal uh, works out for people. Um, but yeah, that was an absolutely trolled auction. As to why it says Mario on it, I, <laughs> I guess it does have Mario. It's technically correct. It's just, <laughs> I just to me, I was more interested. I, I do believe that was a legitimate card. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, um, and it probably, I guess, went through some, and ended up in someone's hands, and they just labeled it with that. I'm more interested in the story of what happened to it. I was kind of hoping maybe you'd know. And there's all kinds of legends and lore that goes along with this thing. Of, you know, even some that uh, I've heard uh, people say were stolen, you know, what have you, from the event or what have you like that. But uh, maybe yeah. we'll never know. Yeah, I don't know personally. I, I, would, I would bet 90% that it, it did change hands with a legitimate buyer, but probably not through eBay. Anyone got anything else for the champ up here? Yes, sir. You know, the uh, smaller competitions, I think, are really good, especially if they're locally based. Um, you know, give somebody um, a chance to interact with the community around them. Because there's one thing to be said about the social media and, you know, online-only competitions. To 
to be honest, I don't really remember a whole lot of uh, sizable competitions. There was the Power Fest series. Well, there was. Well, I remember was Sega. Well, I remember Disney Capcom. It was a Disney Capcom play tour, which a lot of people yeah. don't know about. Where Capcom themselves kind of tried to borrow the concept, but it just didn't fly. Just quite the same. It didn't have. Uh, you know, even I didn't hear about. it. I do remember the Sega one because they did that weird thing. Uh, the finals were actually in Alcatraz mm-hmm. Island, and they were on MTV. Um, and that, but I, I didn't even hear about that one until I turned on my TV and like. Why are they playing on Alcatraz, you know, on Alcatraz Island? You know, but um, you know, nobody ever really get one of the, one of the things too. Even like nowadays, you know, nowadays you have a lot of esports competitions. You have MLG, you have these, and they're doing well. Some of them are doing well. Some of them aren't. But the thing is, I do. I hear people all the time. They're like, "Well, somebody should do that, something like that again, just like that." And sometimes they want it to be the older games and. I don't know that you could ever do something on that scale again using games that aren't at least fairly recent. You know, I don't think you could do it with the retro games to that scale. But I don't know that you can with any because back then, like I said, Nintendo was 90% plus of the video game market. I mean, there wasn't a console war. They, it was Nintendo and whoever else might have a little room on the shelf. Um, you know, the Genesis even then had been out, but even it, the 16-bit, it was even struggling against the NES still at that point. I don't know that you'll ever see a video game brand have that kind of market share ever again in the history of this industry. I would be shocked if you ever did. And I mean, I don't, so therefore, I don't know if you'll ever have something work on that scale like that ever again, because it's not as universal. Yeah, that's pretty well said. I mean, it, it'd be <laughs> difficult to uh, to replicate it for sure. I, I, I still think it would be worthwhile for somebody to do a large-scale tour, but you'd have to really uh, fold in with some other stuff. Like, how cool would it be to have um, something like, like where we're at but was a tour, you know, over, like, say, 10 weeks over 10 major cities um, or 10 markets? Maybe not try to do the whole 30-city, you know, full-year thing, but... You know, over a summer, you know, a summer gaming competition tour, but not make it all about competition. You could do all kinds of fun stuff. Somebody just needs to get brave and write that check. <laughs> all right, we got uh, time for one or two more. Anybody? You, sir. Um, I actually told him we'd hear that joke today, and I was right. Right on time. Thank you for the <laughs> awesome question. I never had a power glove. I did try it. Uh, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was bad. <laughs> it, was, it was so bad. <laughs> um, it was a cool idea. I guess you can sort of see uh, the lineage, you know, with the more interactive stuff we've got these days, where you're, you know, waving at your TV and, uh, you know, motion stuff and all that. So it's cool that it existed. I mean, I, I'd it's neat to see them try things. Yeah, it, well, to me, it's just funny that, that even that resonates now. You know, like I said, I told them we'd hear that joke today, and we did. So, you know, thank you for proving me right on that. <laughs> um, you know, where even what resonates me, there's actually a, a film in the works that's about the Power Glove. There's actually a documentary film in the works about the story of how the Power Glove came to be and the impact it had on people's lives. Um, and I'm really curious about this because, you know, I'm kind of in his camp to where it was like, okay, yeah, and, you know, whatever. But uh, <laughs> no one, I don't want to do that. But, you know, it's, yeah, the impact. We'll find out together, I guess. We've got time for one more quick one here. If anybody has anything. You, sir. Well, I think it's going to be ongoing. Um, I think they're trying to get the marketing right to where they get a lot of internet coverage. I think what they need to do, though, is to merge it like, um, you know, they need to rent out like a big sporting arena, uh, you know, put some other stuff with it, like game giveaways, let people come and try out games. They need to to, uh, to get the public 
involved, you know, and make it something fun where even if you're not good at this game or even if you don't know anything about this game, if you go, come to this event, you'll have fun. That's, what, that's what's missing, I think, with these things. I think they're, they're great for the online crowd. They just need to, uh, to merge it with a live atmosphere. Well, and also that, I mean, you mentioned the online crowd. Uh, to me, that's, that's almost like one of the glass ceilings of those whole things. I mean, they're, it's great that they can stream it live on Twitch and have all these viewers and have all this talk and all that, but it's still, you're still kind of limiting, you know, the audience there a little bit. And, you know, most of the people who I, I feel are tuning in to watch those contests are people who are going to be the type that would try to play in one of those contests and maybe not your, your mainstream crowd, the, the pe same people that turn on an NFL game or something like that. And I think part of the reason why as well with that, that that needs to do to grow is to put the players and the teams and get them out there more. Um, watch the Olympics. And they're not telling you, wait, we got the, the you know, swimming competition coming up or we got this. They're telling you who's in it. They're telling you their stories. They're telling you why you should care that this person is in that contest. The contest is almost secondary to the story they're trying to tell because people are more attracted to watching people than maybe a contest itself. Or it helps make it more dramatic and more interesting to the viewer. And I don't see esports doing that yet in that same manner where if, if you put an M, the biggest MLG contest or League of Legends or anything, if you put that on, on NBC primetime right now, I don't know that it would do that well because the mainstream public doesn't know these people yet. So I would like to see a more comprehensive marketing plan on getting these people kind of celebritized and more into the public eye and telling, you know, using that to draw in more attention and more viewership outside of your Twitch TV, MLG kind of niche group that is, it's kind of, you know, it's, that's doing well, but outside of that, I mean, you just, you're not turning on the TV and hearing about it. You're not picking up the newspaper and hearing about it unless it's a footnote or that sort of thing. I think that's where that is bumping into it. And I don't think, I think that's where it's going to keep bumping into it until somebody comes along or, you know, and changes it, does it that way. Whereas right now, I don't see anybody, you're nodding. I'm seeing a few people nodding. When I tell them that, they look at me like I'm nuts. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, why should I watch this guy play a video? I think it may even be more so than football. I mean, if you turn on, the, a casual person turns on football and doesn't know who this quarterback is, there's, let's face it, they're still going to be sitting on their butt and watching it probably because it, it's, they don't maybe want to get up and go outside and play football with their friends. A video game is a little bit different. It's like, all right, I can sit here and watch these people I don't know playing this video game, or I can press a button and I can play that video game myself. And I think that's, that actually makes it more of a challenge and maybe, make, maybe makes that more important. You know, um, I can use him as an example here as we wrap up. When he won the 1990 Nintendo World Championships, I saw him in other things. We, you know, we I saw him in advertisements. Saw him on the Home Shopping Network. You know, I, you know, he was he was put out there. You know, they used that as this guy is endorsing that, but they weren't just advertising it just to gamers. It was, I said, Home Shopping Network. It was a little more. You know, it was short lived, but it was still a little more broad, a little more mainstream. You don't see that now. Someone wins these a, a big MLG competition or something. You don't see them unless you see them. Maybe they'll show up at E3 or something like that to market. But why aren't they somewhere else? They're not being put into the public's consciousness. And so it's kind of, I think they're shortchanging themselves. I went on that a little longer than I thought it would. So you, you hit a button on that. That could be a whole other panel with me. So um, well, it says we've got 55 seconds to go here. So, I mean, whoa, quick. Uh, I can't claim that, uh, <laughs> but uh, it does prove that my dad had a sense of humor, I guess. Uh, <laughs> my, my son, uh, who's, uh, he was here earlier, he's one and a half. His name is Torsten, which means Stone of Thor. So I'm keeping it going. <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody for coming out here. I want to thank Thor Ackerlin for driving up as well. The champ thank is you. here. I hope all y'all are having fun out here. Go out there. Do some business with the vendors, make some friends. Let's talk about video games, man. Thanks for coming out. Thank Give you. yourselves a round of applause, too.